Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fed Life Podcast. I am your host, Dan Seid. Additionally, I'm the branch manager at Serving Those Serve and Lee Seipen Associates, beginning as I always do with saying thank you for taking the time to listen. Your time is precious. Anytime you give to us, we are grateful. We want to make sure we are worth your while. And also to say thank you for your service. Thank you for service to every single person in the United States. You don't hear it enough. You always will hear. The other thing. Good Lord, one of the crick doesn't rise, you'll always hear, is Ed Zerndorfer. The guru is back as part of our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you. Now, as is always the case, at the outset, I need to say the opinions of our guest, Ed Zerndorfer, are not the opinions of Raymond James are serving those who serve, even though Ed's opinions are usually awesome. This podcast is presented for information only and is not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners consult their personal advisors before taking any action. If you do not have a personal advisor, hit us up at serving those who serve at stwserve.com. We will help you any way we can. As usual, we will be following Ed's Fed Zone articles. You can find them at fed-zone.com, and you will want to find these because we are talking taxes. Ed is absolutely outstanding in this area, and the examples and the calculations that he puts in the articles are fantastic. There's no way we can do them justice on the podcast, so be sure to go there and get it. So, Ed, as I mentioned, we're pressing on with your series of FedZone articles that uh, that will take us all the way up almost to tax time. So, in this case, first up in in this broadcast, will be the taxation of the lump sum refund for a CSRS or FERS employee that leaves federal service. Okay, so walk us through that. Okay, Dan, if a federal employee decides to leave federal service, uh, they, they're not going to stick it out to the time to the point that they're eligible to retire. They decide to leave federal service. The departing employee has the option of getting a refund of their contributions. If you recall, I was mentioning earlier that whether you are a CSRS employee or a service Austin employee or a FERS employee, a part of your paycheck mm-hmm. is being deducted and, con- and contributed to the CSRS Retirement Disability Fund in the case of SERS or SERS Office employee, in the case of FERS employees, a part of the employee's paycheck is being deducted and being contributed to the FERS Retirement Disability Fund. That money will be paid back to the employee to the employee once he or she retires. It's part of the monthly annuity, CSRS annuity, or FERS annuity. And because, it's, because those contributions were made with after-tax dollars, mm-hmm. The, that portion of the annuity will not be taxed again. However, okay. if an employee decides, I don't want to stick it out to retirement, I just want to leave. And because I put that money into the FERS, in the CS or FERS retirement fund, I would, since I'm leaving, I'm not going to get an annuity. I want to receive a, a, a refund, have mm-hmm. it paid back to me, have, mm-hmm. have my agency pay me back those contributions. And because the contributions were already taxed, was, those contributions were made with after tax dollars, that lump sum refund is tax free. Tax free. Gotcha. I get the question are they going to pay interest? The answer is maybe if the employee had less than five years of service when they left. Don't, okay. OPM will pay interest. And that portion, the interest portion, the interest amount would be taxable. So gotcha. in order to do this, a CS rest of service office employee would have to file standard form SF-2802. A FERS employee would, would fill out standard form SF-3106, give it to their agency, and they would receive within a few months this lump sum payment. 
and it's not going to be taxable because the employer already paid tax on it unless a little bit of interest is being paid. But Dan, gotcha. I have to say something here, and I point this out during um, our CSRS and FERS webinars. We hold a FERS mm-hmm. webinar every month. Gotcha. If there's anybody out there, any employee who is thinking about leaving federal service. I know what's coming point, next. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the following plea. Yep. I beg that the employee does not make the mistake of requesting a lump sum payment of the contributions. And I'm saying this for two reasons, Dan. Number one, if the departing employee has at least five years of service, let's say they have between five and 20 years of service, yep. they would be entitled to what is called a deferred retirement. They would get their annuity starting at age 62. Mm-hmm. Age 62. They would get their annuity based, their annuity would be calculated based on their years of service when they left and their high three average salary when they left. That's the first reason. Second reason. If the employee decides, well, I'm going to leave now, but I could always come back to federal service and finish oh, yeah. out my career and then retire. Yep. The the now this employee when they retire will get their annuity based on a higher high three average salary because now they're working let's say years down the road their salary will be higher. And mm-hmm. number two, and this is so important, they would be eligible to keep their benefits such as health insurance. Yep. Life insurance. Dental vision yep, that they're going to lose if they don't come back permanently. I always share this example. I have a colleague of mine who, she's, she's, a, she's also a benefit speaker. I've known her for years. She was in the government 1988, 89, and 1990, three years. She was enrolled mm-hmm. in the Federal Employee Health Insurance for herself and her husband. After mm-hmm. three years of federal service, she told her agency, I wanna, I'm leaving now. And her HR office, personnel office, said to her, you are required to withdraw your contributions that you put into the first system over oh, the last no. few years. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, my colleague said, I know the rules. I don't have to take out my contributions. I can leave them in the system. Don't tell me I got to take out my money. So HR said to her, why are you, you're not going to get any type of deferred retirement because you have to have a minimum five years. You only have three years. Mm -hmm. And she said to them, because I plan to come back at the age of 60, work two years, then retire and keep all my benefits. You know what HR or the personal office said to her, Dan? Nobody ever comes back. Uh, Yep. (laughs) Wrong. They said to her, you're a fool. She said, just trust me. Now, I remember she left in 1990. So, 22 years later, in November 2012, she turned age 60. And guess what she did, Dan? Uh, She got herself a federal federal job. Yep. Right? She worked two years until November 2012, uh, 2014, at which time she turned 62. She was enrolled in the Federal Employee Health Insurance for the three years when she, back 88, 80, 90, covering herself and her husband. And the same thing when she came back in 2012, 2013, and 2014. So she retired. Yep. With a, very, a small annuity. But health benefits. Yep, FEHB. Who's the fool? Who's the fool here, Dan? The person who gave them that bad advice. That's right. Now, remember, if you withdraw your contributions, employees, when you leave, and you decide, I'm going to come back, you're starting all over again. Yep. You're going to lose those years of service. If you leave your money, your contributions in the system, 
then if you do come back, you start, you're starting from that point. Whether you have 10 years of service, 15 years, 20 years of service, you're going to come back and then you're going to resume where you left off. That'll add to your years of service and that will most likely make you eligible to retire at the appropriate if you have if you have come if you end up with 20 years of service when you come back and you work say you left with 17 years of service you work three years you have 20 years of service you could retire at age 60. if you have let's say 25 years of service and you work five years then you can retire at your minimum retirement age trust gotcha. me people have done this sure so that's why I'm saying, Dan, every year, please, yeah. please don't let that lump sum payment, which you're going to probably blow within a few weeks, <laughs> take the money out. Don't. Don't be tempted. It's not worth it. So don't take it out and buy a fancy car or a fancy record player, as my father would say. So That's right. Okay. That's right. Excellent, excellent advice there, sir. All right. So any other wrinkles that, that we need to understand about about that lump sum with withdrawal that we don't think people should take, but in case they do, uh, any any other taxation wrinkles that that folks should consider? Yeah, I've gotten this question, um, Ed. If I take the lump sum payment, can I roll it over to a to a Roth IRA? No. Can mm -hmm. I roll it over to a traditional IRA? No. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. It's uh, it's just your money to 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 to, to you can put it into a. Um, a bank account, you can invest it in a brokerage account, anything you want, but you cannot put it into any type of retirement account. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, I wish you would have asked me beforehand before you did it. Okay. It's not going to be taxable, but uh, unless there's some interest paid on it, that's only if you have less than five years when you left. Okay. I also want to mention that an, one other reason why a FERS employee should not, if they have at least five years of service, um, take out the money because if in fact they come come back if they were classified as a FERS employee pure FERS um, and they and they take out the money and they come back now then they're going to be put into what's called the FERS fray further revise yeah. the new employees FERS has three categories of employees regular FERS FERS Revise the new employees. Those are first employees hired during the years during the year uh, 2013. And anybody um, retired, uh, anybody hired under FERS after December 31st, 2013, is called a FERS further revised employee. And the, the basically it comes down to this: um, a regular FERS employee pays 0.8 percent of their paycheck into the FERS retirement system. A gotcha. FERS re employee pays 3.1 percent. And a FERS Frey employee pays 4.4%. They pay more. So more of your gotcha. paycheck's going to the retirement system if you if gotcha. you were hired after December 31st, 2012. If you left federal service, let's say, with with um, um, 10 years of service, and then you come back and you let your money in the system, when you come back, they'll put you into the system that you were, like the regular FERS. Um, Ooh. If you take out your money, they're, you're, you're, they're going to put you into the FERS Frey system. That's gotcha. one other reason why you should you shouldn't take out your money. Yep, folks, always consider the possibility that you might come back because an awful lot of people do. Awful lot. Never of say do. never. Never say never. Never say never. Never say never. So, Ed, also in the same article, you talk about the the tax treatment of TSP payments. I think people probably have a feel for that, but why don't you spend a little time on it? I have to apologize, uh, Dan. I was trying to get that that column on TSP payments done this week. I could not do it. It'll be out hopefully next week. If you for, forgive okay. me, last week of March. Okay. So no I, problem. I'm sort of busy. So it will come we, out. We will. But you're in tax okay. heaven. Okay. So um, I, I need to point out that the taxation of TSP is a little complicated. I'll, I'll start off with the e with the easy thing with the easy the easy part of this that if a, a, an employee, whether CSRS or FERS, takes money out of their traditional TSP account, when I say take, takes money out, I'm talking about withdrawals. You're asking mm -hmm. for a check to be paid to you. This is called a withdrawal, a distribution, that all traditional TSP payments, distributions, withdrawals, are fully taxable to... Yep the um 
to the recipient, to the employee. I say employee because if you're over 59, if you're in federal service and you're over 59 and a half, you can actually ask for a TSP withdrawal. And uh, in the case of traditional TSP, the entire amount paid to the TSP participant is fully federal and state taxable. Okay. State taxable. Okay? That's traditional. Um, one question I get all the time is, at what age can I start taking money out of my traditional TSP and not be subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty? Gotcha. And boy, have I heard stories about this. I said, Ed, my, my, uh, my financial advisor said that I have to wait until 59 and a half to take money out of my traditional TSB and not be subject to a 10% withdrawal penalty. Mm, not so much. And the answer is that is not correct. The answer is that if you retire sometime during or after the year you turn 55, you can make penalty free, no earl, no 10% early withdrawal penalty money, taking money out of your traditional TSP. That's sure. when it comes to traditional TSP. One more complication, Dan. If there are any special provision employees out there listening, you are a law enforcement officer, or you might be a, fi a federal firefighter, or you might be an air traffic controller. I got some great news for you. That if you retire as a special provision employee at age 50 or older, you can t start taking money out of your traditional TSP starting absolutely right after you retire you don't have to wait till you're 55 you can do it at that point but which makes sense because they special they do have employees which makes sense because they do have they do have earlier retirement requirements and everything so mm -hmm. so that makes sense uh, i've gotten this question though and i'm not a special provision employee but I, my agency is giving an early out i'm retiring at age 51, I'm, I'm not a special for employees because I have 20 years of service. I'm under a voluntary separation incentive program, a VSIP. They're giving us a buyout. And I, and they said, because you have at least 20 years of service, you would be actually allowed to retire. You're, you're over age 50. I like to take money out of my TSP. No. No, you, you're going to have to wait till 59 and a half. Because you retired before age 55. Now, let me ask you a question, Ed. Uh, if they then chose to, say, move some of it into an IRA, would they be able to access un under a 72T provision? The answer is yes. Under IRS, co IRS uh, it's called 72T payments, payments based on life expectancy, actually, it's not only based on life, there's, there's three ways under IRA, Internal Revenue Code 72T that one could take money out of their, their IRA before age 59 and a half and not be mm -hmm. subject to a 10% overall penalty. One is called sure. payments based on life expectancy. There's something called amortization mm -hmm. and something called annuitization. This is all under gotcha. Internal Revenue Code 72T. Ladies and gentlemen, do not do this on your own. Please Very true. Consult Very with true. A, a qualified tax advisor who understands Internal Revenue Code 72T. Yep. This is not for somebody who's not familiar with this type of, type of um, IRS regulations in terms of taking money out of your IRA. You mentioned, Dan, that if someone is 51 years old and they wanted to get access to their T to get access to their TSP, they would roll the money to the IRA to do, to take advantage of this internal revenue code 72 T. That's very mm -hmm. important. You said that Dan, because you cannot do that with the TSP. You would 
have to directly transfer a portion of your TSB account, traditional TSB account, to a traditional IRA. And you could do that as long as you do a direct transfer, there's no ta there's no tax consequences. The money cannot come to you. It has to be a direct transfer from the TSB to the traditional IRA custodian. And then the individual would say to the IRA to the IRA custodian, I would like to do a 72T payout. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. And One folks, we realized we Go just ahead. threw a lot at Go you ahead. there. You know, we, we really, we really threw a lot at you there. Uh, this time, I'll beat out of the punch and and plug it. Ed's Ed's got a tax webinar that. Uh, that he does every month. It's one of our core webinars. Uh, be sure to uh, be sure to look at that menu of webinars, and the great opportunities to have questions answered. We've got the part two follow ups where we can go into your detailed situation a little bit and give you some guidance. But uh, but there's a lot to this, and you know you've heard, for example, first described as a four legged, a three legged table or a three legged stool. We really believe that there has to be a fourth leg, and the fourth leg has to be strategy. You need to have a plan. Your plan needs to be well-reasoned. It needs to be within the code, and it needs to be well-executed. So Ed's advice of, of getting, getting quality advice in these situations, I couldn't agree more. All right, sir. Your Article 4 is, uh, is, is one that I think is going to resonate with a whole lot of people, you know, especially since you're right, they're – there are fewer and fewer new CSRS retirees. The bulk are are in the first system, and Social Security is a big part of that. So, let's talk a little bit about how Social Security payments are taxed. Because I'm sure you I'm sure you get the questions in the webinars saying things like, "Now Social Security is not taxed, right?" And that's not always the case, correct? Um, as my standard is, my standard answer is, Dan, is it all depends. Yep. And I point out in this in this column, this is the fourth column I wrote, the, um, there are some key facts concerning how IRS taxes Social Security. And we're going to talk, by the way, about the states here in a few moments, how the, how the states tax Social Security. Um, yep. But I want to give the four um, key facts regarding how IRS Please taxes do. it. Um. Up to 50% of one's Social Security retirement benefit, and we can't forget, Social Security also pays disability benefits. Yep. Up to 50% of the retirement benefit of an individual's retirement benefit or disability benefits for individuals um, are taxable. 50% are taxable for individuals who, ha um, who have gross incomes of at least $25,000. And by the way, the gross income here we're talking about includes half of one Social Security benefit in a given year, half of it. There's a formula gotcha. that the IRS uses to determine how much of the Social Security is going, to be, um, is going to be taxable. And the gross income would include usual stuff, your, your CSRS or FERS annuity, investment income, interest, dividends, capital gains, rental income, other income. You know what I'm just general income, Dan. Yep. But also, believe it or not, believe it or not, they're going to include in gross income something that is not taxable, and that is municipal bond interest. They're throwing that okay. in there too. too. <laughs> it's called the they call it provisional income. Provisional income. So if the provisional income is at least twenty five thousand dollars, but it's less than thirty four thousand dollars, it's going to end up that a single so someone who files a single or a household will will include 50% of their Social Security benefits in their gross income in, 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 in that will ultimately determine what their taxable income is going to be and taxed accordingly. For married filing individuals, those married ma individuals, couples who file jointly, it go, it's... If their income, uh, the same thing, including 50% of their benefits together with the other gross uh, income, including municipal bond interest, if it's um, 
$32,000, between $32,000 and $44,000, 50% of their benefits, their Social Security benefits will be included in their income and tax accordingly. And if it's, and if it's um, over $44,000, 85%, I forgot to say, I, 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 I'll talk about that here in a moment. But um, if it's less than $44,000, it's going to be ta uh, only 50% is. The single person between mm -hmm. $25,000 and $34,000, uh, married couples, $32,000, $44,000, might as well say right now that if a single person's in, uh, income, gross um, provisional income, again, is over $34,000, then 85% of their Social Security benefits will be included in their income and tax accordingly, and married couples over 44000 Gotcha. Can, can I say one more thing about that? Sure. I, and I'll point that out in the article. That Social Security... Social Security before 1983 was not taxed. When someone received Social Security, it was not included in income. But in 1983, Congress made some major changes to the Social Security system, among other things, raising the full retirement age from 65 to 67. Right. And at that point, as part of this, this Social Security overhaul in 1983, Congress decided they're going to tax Social Security benefits. But not everybody, not everybody is going to be taxed on, social, on their Social Security benefits. Individuals who have less than $25,000 of income are not going to pay tax on their Social Security benefits. $25,000 single, $32,000 for married filing jointly. If your income's less than that, you don't pay tax, you don't include Social Security in your in your in your in your in your in your gross income for tax purposes gotcha the point i want to make is that those limits twenty five thousand, thirty two thousand, dan they have not been changed in 40 years <laughs> no inflation adjustments have been made well there hasn't been Here any inflation in 40 years has there ed there, there hasn't been uh, any inflation I, in 40 years <laughs> there's been inflation over the last 12 months yeah I noticed. <laughs> I read an article that if if Congress would have, uh, you know, would have adjusted those those limits by you know, all the inflation adjustments, colas, whatever, that the twenty five thousand would be up to fifty four thousand, and the forty four and the and the thirty two thousand would be up to like um, seventy two thousand. <laughs> but there hasn't That's been a any difference in adjustments. That makes a big difference. The result is that almost everybody out there, certainly federal militants are going to be including 85% of their Social Security benefits in their income and taxed accordingly. That's the bottom line. Sure. Yep, I think, I think that's a safe bet. And, uh, and folks, again, hit the Fed zone because Ed has some great worksheets in there. But Ed, you, you mentioned there's a Social Security benefits tax tool? Yes, on the IRS, uh, on their website, it has what's called an interactive tax assistant. Mm -hmm. ITA. And in mm -hmm. the article, I give the link how you get on there. Okay. I, I've looked at that, that, that tax tool. It's very easy to use. Please go to my column. It's the fourth column uh, in the series. Yep. It was, I think it was dated uh, March 16th, I believe, uh, yep. last week. And please take advantage of that if you're very interested in seeing how, ta how, how IRS tax, taxes Social Security. Go to that interactive tax assistant um, tool and also yep. look in IRS publication 915 entitled Social Security and Equivalent R Railroad Retirement Benefits. It discusses in more detail how Social Security benefits are, um, are taxed, are taxed. Okay. All right. So we've, we've covered the employee. Now, how about the spousal Social Security benefits? Anything there folks need to know about the taxation? Yes, uh, it's the same rules. Uh, in terms, let's okay. say there is a, a widow, um, a widow, widower, um, their spouse died, and as a result, the widow, widower is going to receive the same payment because it's, it's higher than their own of their deceased spouse. Mm -hmm. Same limits for um, widow, widower. Namely, the twenty-five thousand and thirty-four thousand I was going over earlier for a single for sing, individuals who file a single and have a household. If their if their provisional income 
is less than 25000 that includes half of their um, Social Security benefits. They're not going to pay tax on their Social Security benefits. If they're between 25000 and 34000 provisional income, they're going to include 50% of their Social Security in their benefit. And if their provisional income is above 34000 then they're going to include 85% of their Social Security widow, widower benefit in their income for purposes of calculating their taxable income. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, you, you promised this uh, a little bit ago, but uh, now there are lucky 13 states that don't tax Social Security benefits? Oh, uh, here's the list. Are we ready? We are ready. We're going, we're going in alphabetical order here. Colorado, mm-hmm. Connecticut, Kansas, mm-hmm. Minnesota, mm-hmm. Missouri, mm-hmm. Montana, mm-hmm. Nebraska. Yep. New Mexico, North yep. Dakota, Rhode Island, yep. Utah, yep. Vermont, yep. and West Virginia. Those states tax at least a portion of an individual of resident's Social Security benefit. As with the Got how the gar- as as like the like the government tax Social Security, how it, how a state tax Social Security varies by by income and other criteria. Residents of those states, yes. please talk to a a qualified accountant, tax accountant, who will explain how your state taxes your Social Security. Gotcha. And then you uh, you round out with some strategies to minimize taxes on Social Security. Why don't you talk about those? Yes, this is very important because there's things that individuals can do to minimize the taxes that are going to pay on Social Security. Remember I was talking about, Dan, um, this provisional income. And what is provisional income again? Basically, it is if you, if, if you add up all your income, that, you, that, 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 that just your gross income, a CS annuity, a FERS annuity, interest income, dividend income, capital gain investment income, rental income, uh, money coming out of your TSP, you might have IRA distributions, all that's considered to be, uh, be including your gross income. And you might have some adjustments to your income, so you're going to end up with your, uh, and, and then add to that half of your Social Security benefit, half of that, and that will end up what's called your provisional income. If you have any tax-free interest, also include that to come up with your provisional income. Now, notice I said traditional TSP and traditional IRAs. Mm-hmm. What about Roth IRAs? What about Roth TSP withdrawals? Will they be including your income? Well, my guess is no. Um, once again, Dan, it all depends. All depends. My stand. All depends. I didn't mention this when it came to the TSP. The TSP has the Roth TSP, and boy, do I get these questions about the raw TSP. And we will talk about, we talk about that during our tax, our, our, our monthly tax webinar for serving those who serve. But yep. let me explain about the raw TSP. That one can take money out of the raw TSP and not pay tax on the earnings. Understand that the money that was contributed to the raw TSP from an, a federal employee's paycheck was made with after tax dollars, not pre tax dollars. So the contributions to the raw TSP are certainly not going to be taxed again when they're taken out. What about the earnings in the raw TSP? Will they be taxed and taken out? And the answer is no, provided that. The raw TSP participant fulfills two requirements. Requirement number one, they have to be over age 59 and a half. Well, the earliest age you can get a Social Security check is age 62. So we're going to assume that this indiv- this federal annuitant taking money out of the raw TSP, okay, um, is over age 62, receiving a Social Security check. So the contributions coming out of the Roth TSP are not going to be taxed. If they're over 59 and a half, 
the, the contributions are already taxed. But what about the earnings? And the earnings portion of the Roth TSP is not going to be taxed, provided it has been at least five years since January 1st of the year that the Roth TSP participant made his or her very first contribution to the Roth TSP account. It goes back to that first year. The Roth TSP started in 2012. If somebody made a Roth TSP contribution, let's say their very first one, back in 2014, anytime during 2014, their five-year meter started as of January 1st, 2014, go forward five years to January 1st, 2019, so anytime after January 1st, 2019, assuming that the Roth TSP um, participant is over age 59 and a half, they can all, their distributions from the Roth TSP will be completely tax-free and not be part of one's gross income. Gotcha. So federal employees, while you're contributing to the TSP, think about this. If you're putting money into the Roth TSP, you may end up with less taxable income, less gross income, which will turn into taxable income when you are taking money out of the TSP account, which could lead to a lesser percentage of your, your Social Security benefits, a less, lesser percentage of Social Security benefits being included in your income. That's Roth TSP. What about Roth IRAs? Identical rule, Dan. In okay. order to take the earnings out of a Roth IRA and not have to pay tax on those earnings, the Roth IRA owner has to fulfill two rules. Rule number one, they got to be over 59 and a half. Number two, it has to be at least five years since the year the Roth IRA owner made his or her first Roth IRA contribution. It goes back only to that first year. Therefore, if the, if the Roth IRA owner fulfilled the rules, the Roth IRA owner has fulfilled those two requirements, and they take money out of the Roth IRA when they're receiving Social Security benefits, the Roth IRA distribution is not going to affect how much of their social security benefits is going to be included in income. So that's one, that's gotcha. one, one way. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And a second, two way? A second yep. way, the second way, Dan, is that those individuals who may retire before they're going to start drawing their social security. Once again, the earliest age you can draw social security is age 62 I suggest during our Social Security webinar, Dan, we have a Social Security webinar. Okay? Yes, we do. Just had one last week that individuals wait as long as possible to take the Social Security because the longer you wait, the more you're going to get. They could start as early as age 62. Ideally, they're encouraged to wait till 70 because if they wait till 70, they'll get the maximum benefit by waiting till age 70. But until they start drawing Social Security, they're encouraged to start taking money out of their taxable retirement accounts, take as much out before they start their Social Security, because after they start their Social Security, if they take money out of the Roth accounts and less out of the retirement accounts, that could lead to a lesser percentage of Social Security income, uh, Social Security benefits being included in income. Remember again... Sure. That Roth, qualified Roth IRA, qualified Roth TSP withdrawals will not be included in income. So before you start your security benefits, concentrate on, the, on, on taking money out of the taxable accounts. Taxable traditional IRAs, tax, uh, taxable traditional TSP. Gotcha. Okay. No, makes and, sense. And there is a third way. Yeah, a lot of and, folks are not going to know about this one. So I'm kind of excited that you're throwing this one in. It's called a Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. What is, a, what is a Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract? A QLAC. It is a deferred annuity 
funded with a lump sum direct transfer funds from a qualified retirement plan or a traditional IRA. So what's, a, what's an example of a qualified retirement plan? TSP. TSP. A federal employee can transfer a portion of their traditional TSP. It's a maximum $135,000. A maximum $135 to a QLAC. And what's so special about that? As I mentioned, it is a deferred annuity. But the beauty of the QLAC is that when you reach your required beginning age, which now for most people is age 72, any money that's in that QLAC is not subject to a required minimum distribution, RMD. All oh, the RMD rules are so much fun, Dan, aren't they? Yes, they are. Boy, we're getting a lot of questions. No, about no, that. no, I'm not. No, they're not. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when IRS changes the life expectancy tables. They did in January. So the fact of the matter is, and I, I wrote actually, I wrote a column about that uh, about the change of life expectancy tables. I, I forgot which month, but it's up there. Just, just. Um, just Google when you get to the, to the Fed zone. Just yep. Google the word "change in life expectancy tables," and I wrote a whole yep. series about it. It affects not only uh, people who take money out of their TSP; um, it also affects, um, I mean, for their RMD rules. If you inherited an IRA from, let's say, mom or dad, and you're taking, you have to take money out of that IRA because you're subject to the rules. Um, you're affected by these new life expectancy tables too. Please read the article. Absolutely. Anyhow, here's the point. The problem with these RMDs is that they are included in your income. They are, if in the case of the TSB, yes, all, R, all RMD payouts are will be included in one's income starting when you're 72. Every year you got to take out an RMD if you have retired in federal service. If you transfer... Uh, let's say the maximum possible $135,000 of your traditional TSB to a traditional to a traditional IRA and then in turn purchase a qualified longevity annuity contract that $135,000 that's going to grow inside the contract by the way tax deferred yep. that portion is not going to be subject to RMD result your RMD amounts at least for the time being, until you're 85. At that point, you gotta you gotta take the money out of the uh, the, con the contract at age 85. At least for sure, those 13 or so years, will not be included in income. Result is, a lesser amount of your Social Security benefits will be included in your income, and therefore less tax ought to be paid. Makes sense. Makes sense. And friends, again, I cannot stress this enough. Especially with this, you need to head over to the Fed Zone, fed-zone.com, and read Ed's columns because the detail he has in there is truly extraordinary. You are not going to find it anywhere else. It's accessible. It's understandable. It is awesome. Brother, you, you are a treasure for all the Feds and for us. Can't thank you enough for it. Folks, that is a wrap. We are serving those who serve, so be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel and Spotify. And please remember to share it with friends and strangers. The numbers are going up. We feel great seeing that. Thousands of people are listening each month. Let's get that to tens of thousands. The more people that come in and get the basics, and you will always be able to find the basics you need to understand your benefits at Serving Those Who Serve. We've got tons and tons of really good content that are that's going out every single week to help you get there. You want to go further, you want to get into strategies, things like that, we're here for that too. So check us out on Twitter, LinkedIn. Do not miss those live webinars every single week at stwserve.com. You'll see the big blue webinar button, hover right over it, it turns red, click it, it will take you to the menu, and the guru will come to you. We will reach you where you are, teach you where you are, and above all, serve you where you are. Share that page with your friends, they will thank you. And always, watch Fred's blogs every month in the Fed Zone. And for Ed, the crew at Serving This Serve, and me, Dan Sipe, good luck.
Godspeed, and above all, remember, it is your fed life. So please make it a great one because you deserve it. Stay well, everybody. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Sipe and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation.